Okay, so you've got an old Coleman stove. No matter how you got it, you got it from your grandfather's estate, your, it was sitting in the back of your father's garage for 30 years, and you remembered what it was like to have to use that and, and have breakfast on it when you were camping when you were a kid. Or you went down in a flea market or a garage sale or the thrift store, you bought one of these. And you, now you've got it home, what are you going to do with it? One of those spur of the moment purchase. Now you got to figure out, are you going to fix this or what? Okay, on YouTube, there seems to be a lot of videos on how to do bits and pieces. How to change, fix the pump on the fuel tank. How to fix a burner, how to fix this, how to fix that. But nowhere does there seem to be a video on how to restore one of these from start to finish and make it come out looking like new. These little stoves are one of the most brilliant engineering feats of the 20th century. Coleman, when they designed these, they designed them to work forever. Simple, rugged, reliable, thoroughly dependable, they just keep going. You think about it, how many pieces of camping gear have you ever heard of that still function after 60 or 70 or 80 years and they're still doing their job? This is one of them. And we're going to show you how to restore one of these from start to finish, from look like looking at it in the thrift store seeing what it looked like, rating the condition, bringing it home, tearing it apart, clean everything up, repair it, put it back together, and she'll be ready to go for another 50 years. What we're going to do here, we'll use this as our example. This is a 1977 model 425. Uh, the 425 has been in continuous production since 1948. It's that popular. I mean, it's been around continuously in different model forms for over 70 years. And you can still go to Coleman's website right now and buy one of these, just like this. The process you need to go through is very simple here. You get one of these before you even buy it at the yard sale or anything else. Take a look at it. We'll open it up here. This one is in remarkably good shape for being 42 years old. It's in pretty darn good condition. But whether it's nasty, dirty, clean, whatever, let me show you some things you need to look at before you take it home. Get you in just a second. Let me move the camera so you can actually see down here. All right. Now, uh, see if I can look through the camera viewfinder and find all this stuff. But the things you need to look out for are make sure it's intact. You want to make sure it has all the parts. Make sure it's got a tank. The tank has a fuel cap. The burners are all here. The rack is good. Sometimes these things, this rack has been heated so much that these bars will soften up and bend or warp. Um, if, the, if it's covered in rust, grease, dirt, grunge, like it hasn't been cleaned in 50 years, and that stuff is baked on and black and nasty, depends on how much you work you want to put into it. You may want to leave it, step aside, and go for a different one simply because if it's been that neglected to where everything is all black and burned and nasty and it's had food burned on it for 40 years that is an indicator that the owners never did any maintenance on it so it chances are it's going to need quite a bit of help if you don't mind the work and effort that's going to be involved in cleaning it and getting the parts you need and restoring it completely that's fine, go ahead and buy it. But if you can find something that looks like this at a yard sale, this is almost perfect 
for being 42 years old and isn't and hardly ever used. This was bought at my local thrift store for a purchase price of five dollars. So it's clean. It's not been used a whole lot. But what we're going to do is just for the sake of things to show you the start to finish, we're going to take this down completely to individual parts and restore the repaint and restore the entire thing. So let me get it over to the workbench and I'll show you how that gets done. Okay, here at the bench, these are the tools that you're going to need to disassemble one of these stoves. You're going to need a 7 16 deep well socket and ratchet or even better if you don't have one of that and don't want to use one is a 7 16 nut driver. Uh, you'll need uh, something to use as a, a scraper. I'm using in this case a gasket scraper. You'll need either a flathead screwdriver or a number two Phillips screwdriver depending on the year of your stove. The uh, ones from about uh, 19, 1970 newer used Phillips head screws and the ones earlier than about 1970 used flathead screws. Uh, it's a really a good idea if you've got one or can get one to use get a gunsmith screwdriver to do this. Um, here, if you look at this gunsmith screwdriver, you'll see that it's kind of an odd shape. What it is, is it's square. If you, look, if you look here on the edge, it's a square edge, whereas a standard screwdriver is tapered. And you can see the difference. With the ta standard screwdriver tapered, uh, if you put it into a screw slot and turn it, you can very easily have it slip and mar the screw. Gunsmith screwdrivers, on the other hand, are flat and square, and they fit perfectly into the slot of the screw, and so when you put torque on it, the chances of it slipping and marring the screw are a lot, a lot slimmer than using a, a standard screwdriver. But either one of these will, should work, do the trick. I just prefer the, the gunsmith screwdriver. And you need a small flat tip screwdriver, maybe an eighth of an inch to use to get inside a couple of little areas and, and pry things loose. I'll show you that as we go. And this is not part of the tools. This is your handy dandy if you're rebuilding one of these and putting it on video, it's your pointer. <laughs> so this doesn't count. Okay, let's get to the work and get started on the disassembly. Okay, here as we brought it home from the thrift store is our stove, we've opened it up, and magically, you made a good choice. This one's clean and ready to go. So what we're going to do, the first thing you need to do is remove this top. If you look over here, you'll see that there's a hinge here, and one over here on this side. These hinges stick into a little tab on the, on the, sword, on the sides. So, well, all you need to do to remove the entire top is take these hinges and push them inward and pull them straight out. So what I'm going to do here is lower the top a little bit and take this one on this side and we will pull it towards me and it pops right loose. And once this first hinge is loose we can just kind of take the rest of it and pull it out and it comes right out. That's how simple it is. Once you've done one of these you can disassemble one of these stoves in about five minutes. Next thing we need to do is remove this rack. Depending on the stove model you've got, the little clips here that hold this rack could be these, like these little round clips like this. They could be clips that go through and are screwed in from the back like the uh, model 413 or they could have uh, clips that go through here they're screwed from the back and they also have the hinge for the lid in the back all held in place with one screw just depends on the model if you've never ever done one of these before it might be a good idea to take pictures as you go so you see how things are before you take it apart 
and that gives you something of a guide for when you put things back together. Okay, these are, this has the standard old push-through uh, clips. These little clips are one-way clips. They only go in, in, and they don't ever want to come back out. Uh, all it is is a little piece of bent sheet metal, but they have tabs sticking on them. And those tabs, once they're pushed through this sheet metal, spring out and they prevent that from ever coming out again. So what we'll do, have to do here is, these things have quite a bit of slop in them from the factory. We just push it in one direction. In this case, I'm going to push it that way as far as I can. And then we're going to take our thumb and push this bar out through the edge of the clip. Like that. Just push it out, and there'll be enough, you should be able to get enough slack to push it just enough to clear that clip, and then you can slide the whole thing off. The clips just stay in place. Fuel tank. We're just going to take the fuel at this time. We'll just take the fuel tank out, set it aside. Rebuilding this fuel tank will be a separate video. Now we're left with just the body and the burner assembly. This burner assembly is held in with two nuts and a screw. Back here in the corner, let me see if we can tune you in here. Back here in the corner, right there, down at the base, there's a screw that goes through to the bottom, then it holds the back of this burner assembly in place. Depending on the model, this screw could be here on the bottom, or it could be over here on this side, back against the back wall. So I will re now I will remove that screw, and this is a 1970s, so it will be a Phillips head screw, right here. These screws are held in with a tab, a little black tab that looks like this. Don't lose that. You'll need it when you put it back together. Okay, here's where either the ratchet or the 7 16 nut driver come into place. Okay, looking at the front of the stove, if we tilt the thing up on its back, there's two holes in the bottom. If you look into the holes, I don't think I can get it on camera, but there's two little, there's two nuts in here, one here, one here, and they're, they're just held in very gently by just one little piece of sheet metal. So we'll use our 7 16 nut driver to get in here and remove that. give you a look at it here. This is not a normal nut. This is basically a piece of stamped sheet metal. And let's see here, a little piece of stamped sheet metal. And all it's got to hold it in place is one little tab right here. But you don't want to lose this. Again, put it aside someplace where you're not going to get have it lost. One more on this side. it up and the whole burner assembly comes out in one piece. We'll disassemble this and clean it and show you everything you need to look to do to get this back into pristine condition again when we get to do the another video on the fuel system. One more piece to go. Inside these, the newer ones, is this sheet metal drip tray right here. Okay, and the, the, the burner assembly nests right here on, the, on top of it. This needs to come out. Uh, you'll see it's held here and here on both sides. Got two screws on each side. You just take the screws out and this little piece of sheet metal will pop right out.
These don't have the clips in the backs, just the screws, so they will just come right apart. In some of the earlier models, this green, this uh, piece of sheet metal, this drip tray, is a uh, galvanized steel that's just shiny silver. And they have a tendency to rust over the years, so you probably end up having to paint those. So you have the option. The ones in the 70s and later, like these, were painted. Some of the early ones were not. So what we're going to do is, since this one's already been painted, we're just going to give it a good cleaning and sanding, and then when we paint the body, we'll paint this too. Base. The drip pan, the burner assembly, the fuel tank, the rack, and the, and the top. How long did this take? Seven minutes? Eight? All right. Now comes the fun part. We get to go clean. Ugh. See? This is really backyard engineering if you're having to do this in the kitchen sink. Little word of warning, if you're going to do this in the kitchen sink, make absolutely sure that when you're done, everything gets perfectly clean around here when you're finished, because you really don't want to hack off she who must be obeyed. Trust me on this. So all you need to really clean these is hot soapy water and one of these soap impregnated steel wool pads coming around here in the US SOS steel wool pads for cleaning for just general cleaning a regular old plastic sponge works just fine with the hot water if it's really baked on nasty stuff you're going to want to use this but be warned using these steel wool pads these steel wool pads are going to take the paint off of the here. So uh, if you're going to repaint it anyway, by all means go ahead with the steel wool pad. But if you don't want to mess up with the paint, you might want to stick to just the regular scrubber and soap and water. So I will get in here with the soap and water. Since I'm going to paint this anyway, I will get in, in these areas that, you know, in the corners, along the sides, up in here, along the front, down in here in the bottom, is in, in the right hand half of the stove is where most of the grunge and nasty stuff Fortunately, in this case, since this was a pretty clean unit, this one's going to come clean pretty easy. So I'll get back to you out in the garage when everything is done. Okay, we're back out in the garage now. All the green stuff in the rack has been cleaned as best we can, and we're ready to continue on. Before we do that, though, let me uh, give you a couple of t things here that I forgot to tell you earlier. Uh, first off, the fuel or the burner assembly. This does not go in the in the washer. You don't scrub this down with water. The uh, reason why this is uh, galvanizing, 
to very thin galvanizing and it will rust really easily. So if you get water inside of this assembly, no matter how much air you blow through it or whatever, you're not going to get it completely dry. Uh, your best bet is uh, to just take, take it uh, and use a wire brush and clean it as best you can with a wire brush or a wire wheel. Try to get all the rust off. Get it as clean as you possibly can. We're using a wire wheel or some very light uh, 400 grit sandpaper or something like that. And get it as clean as you possibly can. And then what we'll do, uh, we're gonna, I'll show you how to disassemble this in the next video where we'll take it apart, clean everything and put it back. And then what we're going to do is we're going to paint this whole assembly because this is always the first thing that rusts. And we want to avoid the rust because that will destroy our stove. So what we're going to do is we're going to paint this with this stuff. This is a VHT flame proof paint. It's header paint for drag racing cars. And if it can stand 1400 degrees of, of header temperature, it can, it can stand the open flame of this stove. Uh, in fact, I've been using this for 20 years and I've never had anything burn through it yet. So we'll spray it with this after we're all done, make it nice and pretty and silver, and it'll stay that way for the life of the stove. One other thing I want to show you while I got it all apart here is on the bottom of this stove, I don't know if you can see it here. Let's see if I can get it right there. You can see right here, 477. This is the build date for the stove. All of these Coleman stoves from about 1970 onward had the build date stamped on the bottom. Uh, if, you're one, if your stove is earlier than 1970, it's not, there's no stamp on there. However, in a lot of cases, if you look on the fuel tank, flip it over and look on the bottom side of the suspending hinges on the fuel tank, there will be a date stamped in there. And that will be not going to be the date of the stove, that's the date the tank was made, but chances are very good if this is the original tank that came with the stove, it was made within a couple of months of when the stove was. Yeah, there's a date right in here, but I don't have my reading glasses handy, so I can't really tell you what it is. Anyway, it does have a date in it. But I know from the bottom of the stove that it's April of 1977, so this tank was probably made in close to the same time. In our next video, we're going to take this apart, clean it, put it all back together, and give it a good paint job. Then we'll set it aside and be ready to move on to other things. That'll be coming up, part two. See you then.